orchestration and all of this. And this is something that uh, use of uh, mobile tools have been uh, well researched and well implemented in India, but we still have plenty of opportunities to make it kind of a system owned uh, approach. And uh, so we've had one round of interactions with people who are users, both from uh, healthcare users, that is uh, people who run hospitals, um, independent doctors in the representative from the World Medical Council and uh, Indian Medical Association, as well as a few users. We had the TB uh, advocates group and um, some patient engagement groups as well. And there we gathered their voices and perspectives. And then uh, we spoke to people both from the technology platform side as well as uh, from end users uh, of this technology that is both platform uh, providers and hospitals and also had uh, for in the session service really wrapping up and trying to look at um, how do we really use this opportunity and how could we look at some best practices and um, specifically to you Dr. Tulsar uh, that when we go for, go for care in a hospital setting we um, know that this particular hospital is of a certain quality because that is benchmarked and uh, but here is a platform which is kind of uh, anonymized or white label and one how does one uh, a person who is uh, using these services be assured of a certain level of quality or uh, how do we uh, in in hospitals we are made to measure uh, outcomes and um, what happens to that in a telehealth or a digital environment and of course professor tandon has been working very closely in putting together this whole thing, how this will span out for the health and wellness centers. And um, he's been trying to bring the best evidence globally and try to implement that at scale through the Aishman Bharat program and um, clinical guidelines based care. So we look forward to um, get your inputs on that. And we have Dr. Sita Rama Budraja, who is the medical head at Tata Trust. He's just joined us, so welcome. I was just introducing uh, the concept and uh, as we all know, Tata Trust have been doing significant amount of uh, implementation support to state governments, both uh, uh, in the area of non-communicable diseases as well as health system strengthening and uh, uh, capacity building. And we would like to hear from you, Dr. Sitarama, about um, where you see telehealth headed. You have hands-on experience in having implemented this for some of the states in, in the form of telemedicine. And uh, so we would like to hear that from you. And we also have uh, Mark Landry, who is the regional advisor at WHO CRO, who's responsible for health information systems and digital health. He will be sharing with us um, some best practices in terms of the WHO guideline framework for digital health ecosystem. <laughs> and how does that relate in the context of telehealth? And we also have uh, the CEO of the Australasian Digital Health uh, Digital Health Institute, and uh, they have been using telehealth quite a lot, and they have a very citizen centric <clears throat> So we would probably request for some input from uh, Dr. Louis as well. Mark, welcome. I'm just introducing the speakers to each other. Yes. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So we, we have uh, Professor Tandon, we have um, Dr. Atul, Dr. Sitarama, and Mark, and we're waiting for uh, Lois to join us. So the, the way we would do this uh, is that we would pose a few questions to each of you and request you to respond to those questions uh, in um, about two minutes, and then uh, we would perhaps reflect on what you have shared. And on the basis of that, we will have the conversation going. But I have kind of shared with you key points where uh, we would like each of you to focus on and to dwell upon. Uh, welcome, Lois, and thank you for joining us. I'm, I would like to introduce you to the rest of the panel here. Dr. Lois is the CEO of the Australia, Australasian Institute of Digital Health. Uh, she's been, very, okay. been a very active uh, advocate for health information systems and digital health and uh, look forward to hearing from you what happens uh, and how you've been able to leverage telehealth for strengthening the health delivery systems in Australia uh, and what 
key examples you might have as as India is moving on or leapfrogging as we call it uh, in in this area. Thank you all for joining, and I think we are at two, and we can go live if everybody is fine with that. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Sir, uh, Oman. So I'm going live. Uh, yeah. Just give me two minutes. Yes, Oman. So we are live now. Uh, you can start. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to all of you from all across the globe. It's an honor and privilege to welcome all of you to this um, policy discussion on telehealth ecosystem. And as we have been discussing, um, there is a huge opportunity in India at the moment as we have uh, seen the power of telemedicine and the practice of medicine through technology. Um, however, there is also an opportunity to really leverage this to bridge some of the gaps that exist currently in terms of our supply and demand. And while doing so, we should try and uh, build upon what we already have in terms of the uh, strengths of our health system and health delivery <coughs> systems, and also our aspirations. We want to achieve universal health coverage, and can we really use uh, telehealth as a tool for that? And but to join us today, we have uh, an excellent panel of experts who've been doing this and have real insights how to do it at scale and implement it on the ground and reap the benefits of that. So it's my honor and privilege to welcome Professor Nikhil Tandon, who is a professor of endocrinology and metabolism at All India Institute of Medical Sciences. He's an elected fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, Indian Academy of Science, and member of the Board of Governors superseding the uh, Medical Council of India and a um, strong contributor to te the telemedicine practice guidelines. And he's been working very closely on seeing how telehealth could be used in the context of um, the health and wellness centers. And it's an honor to have you, sir. Uh, we have Dr. Atul Pacher, who is the uh, Chief Executive Officer at the NABH, National Accreditation Board for Healthcare and Hospitals. And he's a board certified dermatologist and he's been a senior consultant in the Delhi government and uh, also working at LNGP hospitals. And he's a passionate advocate for quality improvement. He himself been an NABH assessor for several years and now he's leading the whole quality initiative uh, in, the in the country. And he's also uh, got a program of work under his guidance uh, for the digital health standards uh, for India, and uh, we will hear from him about that. We have Dr. Sitarama Budaraja, who is the medical head at Tata Press, and he uh, has a very deep expertise in health system strengthening and has worked across different foundations and uh, in the health system space. And he oversees the electronic health records, the health system strengthening projects, and right across communicable diseases and non communicable diseases for the Tata Press. We look forward to hearing from him about hands-on experience of uh, implementing telemedicine in the state context for the governments and how the uptake has been. We have Mark Landry, who is the regional advisor for health information <coughs> systems, part of the health systems um, unit at regional office for or the WHO uh, in Delhi. And he will be speaking to us about the governance frameworks as well as the digital health framework and the strategy that the WHO is advising on national governments Dr. Louis um, Chapo is the CEO, uh, CEO at the Australasian Institute of Digital Health. He was the president of the Health Informatic Society of Australia for several years and has done excellent work in mainstreaming digital health as a subject. They do board certification in health informatics in Australia, and she will be sharing some of the best practices and how they have leveraged it for strengthening their health service delivery. Uh, so I will now um, request Professor Tandon to share with us his uh, views on how he sees uh, the telehealth ecosystem evolving in India, particularly from a point of chronic disease management. Because as we know, telemedicine can be done one-off for a consult, but for somebody with diabetes or something uh, that needs long-term comprehensive 360-degree view uh, of a person's health. Um, so how do you see uh, the telemedicine or telehealth practice evolving in India in the context of 
what we have today as well as as we go forward so i'm going to i'm going to start by deviating briefly from your question i just wanted to give a little historical perspective to the telemedicine guidelines because in a lot of the discussion will perhaps hinge on you know where they are and what what can happen with them so just wanted to put the record straight that while these guidelines got notified very recently in in march and it appeared that they were uh, sort of a response to the covid pandemic the reality is that these guidelines actually uh, we started working on them sometime towards last year right so that so this we clearly had not anticipated a pandemic so this work was started towards the latter half of 2019 it was initiated at the niti aayog but because it had implications for the regulatory framework it was shifted to the mci it would be truthful to say that you know they were accelerated with the onset of the covid pandemic but this work was already there um I, 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 the question that you ask is and that and it's perhaps the least controversial part of of the telemedicine practice is the use of of these guidelines and the use of telemedicine per se for chronic disease and as, as you would re realize that a lot of chronic disease is asymptomatic regular in you know visits to the doctor in which a large part of that is a is is a a review based on question and answers and a review of um, investigations right so let let me look at diabetes because that's what i do for a living and you know that's my day job as they say and um, so you really you will see a patient and you'll say that well this is all right we prescribe this for your diabetes for your sugars for your pressures for your cholesterol we ask them for a dietitian's review and then say well let's look at how you responded to this in 3 months from now and what really happens 3 months from now is uh, checking on them whether they're doing fine and reviewing their investigations and seeing whether those can be translated into a continuity of the prescriptions or a change in prescriptions now in reality if you actually examine a seen a patient at the first time uh, there's not a lot which is going to be added by a fresh physical review 3 months down the line uh, 90% of the times you can actually manage this with a conversation supplemented by a review of the investigation so really in those circumstances you would be saving the patient a trip to the hospital uh for uh, actually a reasonably reasonably good assessment of what is required and a management decision also so in that perspective for a large proportion of chronic disease management uh telemedicine or teleconsultations interspersed with physical reviews would actually suffice and suffice very well for the sort of care that we would normally like to provide to them so i think for chronic diseases and i've used that as a using diabetes as an exemplar i would say uh, a teleconsultation would actually be a very very good addition to the existing practices of care delivery thank you uh, women i'll just respond to dr tandon thank you dr tandon for you know bringing out two very powerful points one is about the mci guidelines which we really really have you know made life so much easier for a lot of our colleagues because it gives clarity and i think to be honest uh, they have been pretty uh, comprehensive i think it's a fantastic job for the first iteration of course it will continue to iterate as we get uh, as we get more and more use uh, of the guidelines uh, having said that uh, one of the things that we are battling with and i will like to just you know in in time for the for the panelists and the audience to respond to that is okay we have telemedicine in telemedicine we have the doctors who come under the purview of mci so they are being you know regulated there their practice we have uh, the clinical establishment act which sort of regulates the hospitals and the providers and then we also have any bh and any bl which are sending st standards for uh, and looking after patient interest perspective uh, from the uh, lab and the hospitals perspective but then who is uh, regulating the telemedicine guys so that's one major area that i think needs to be addressed and one of the things that we will like to talk about in the future so thank you so much for bringing in that in the other part was the ncd piece oh my gosh that is big right i mean all of us across the world are battling with ncds non communicable diseases 
uh, I'm patient compliance and adherence. And I think telemedicine is wonderful that way. I mean, when I say telemedicine, I'm talking about patient education. We're talking about teleconsult. We're talking about behavioral change. We are talking about comprehensive diet management, psychological assessment, education. Um, we are talking about monitoring uh, specific to the patient's clinical condition rather than, you know, some blankets kind of stuff. So, you know, there is this whole gamut that is needed to ensure that the patient stays healthy and complication free. And I think as Dr. Tandon very clearly said, he's been using it for diabetes, but frankly speaking, heart failure, liver failure, kidney failure, uh, post-surgery, pre-surgery, long-term follow-ups. I mean, it's all over there, right? So every specialty actually can utilize this very powerfully. So I'd like that also to be discussed in the next uh, few minutes when we, you know, I'd like to hear from, from our panelists, if you could sort of talk a little bit on this. Thank you, Uman. Thank sure, you, Dr. I, I would request then, uh, Dr. Atul, because we did talk about um, how do we ensure that um, we have a certain level of quality, like Dr. Shanoi uh, asked. So if somebody is coming into a hospital, you have a quality benchmark, but when you do it on an electronic platform, how, do you be, how will you be assured of the quality? Uh, Dr. Atul, if you could please throw light on where we see uh, the whole of the telehealth ecosystem from a perspective of ensuring quality and in, in terms of making sure that no harm is done through technology, uh, what would your perspectives on that be? Yeah, Dr. Uman, so good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity. So what Professor Nikhil Tandon also said, I mean, because of the pandemic or in spite of the pandemic, this opportunity was thrown into uh, the gamut actually. And uh, the, the telemedicine guidelines which have been uh, given to the nation uh, by Board of Governors in uh, supersession of the MCI, which uh, Dr. Tandon has been spearheading the process. Uh, so this is a wonderful document, right? I mean, this is for the first time, let's say the version one. So we had to begin somewhere and as a beginning, it's a wonderful document, uh, complete in so many aspects. There may be uh, uh, things to look forward to, aspire to, but uh, there are obviously certain questions which you rightly pointed out about the quality of care, which Dr. Robinson also said, uh, where, uh, like we are here now and uh, where from here, where, where to proceed further. So with that in mind, actually, and the same questions were cropping up for us also. So we formed our digital health uh, standards. We initiated that work uh, uh, within the regulatory framework, which is existent across world also, and in India also, which is a very robust network, if I may say so. Uh, so within that, so we had to consider all the aspects of information capturing, privacy, security, interoperability. So when we, when we talk about telehealth or digital health, uh, I would say that telemedicine or teleconsult, which by itself is a good area, but ultimately keeping it in perspective would be a very small percentage of the entire possibility of the entire spectrum of digital health we are uh, to be taking, right? So digital health would include all your wearables also, all your mHealth also, all your uh, cross-border uh, triaging also, cross uh, you know visiting the medical value tourism also ultimately, uh, and and remote care, which which is a boon for a country like uh, resource challenged in certain areas, a country like uh, India, where it vastly increases the reach of the specialist. Let's say Professor Tandon, I mean, uh, many people would not have a direct access to uh, him otherwise, uh, uh, talking about his endocrinological skills. But, but with a telemedicine consult, his expertise can be taken to the far-flung nooks and corners of the country by hub and spoke model, by, by a graded approach. So this is a wonderful thing. Now, coming to the uh, other aspect, the privacy, information, security, interoperability, all those aspects have to be consulted for. And with that in mind, we initiated, like I said, the digital health standards, uh, which have been very fortunate to receive the nominations of all major stake players, uh, stakeholders, including the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, uh, the Bureau of Indian Standards, the Telecom Ministry, the MIT, the WHO, uh, everybody, I mean, so they're already the CDAC, which has created uh, the Sanjeevni project. So practically everybody uh, who's working in this space is now part of the uh, 
committee. They are giving their uh, precious outputs, including National Health Authority, which recently brought out the National, National Digital Health Mission and the National Digital Health Blueprint. So all these factors they are considering, and NABH is also trying to collate and make a graded systems-based approach where we give to the nation, to the doctors, uh, a very palatable document, you know, very palatable document which addresses all these concerns. We are consulting all leading stakeholders in this area, including Professor Yankuk from WHO Geneva, uh, uh, Dr. Michael Kirwan, uh, uh, yesterday, uh, uh, Mr. P uh, Chuck P Chuck Parker addressed us. He is uh, representing Continua, the IT Alliance. So, so basically, everybody who's anybody in this space uh, wishes to contribute. We are ready for the guidance and we are willing to come out with a document which will address all such concerns, uh, starting from the basic to a graded approach of ultimately maybe you know addressing uh, the Internet of Things also, how devices uh, talk amongst themselves. So it, it's a it's a very wide spectrum. But we had to make a beginning somewhere. And this document, the telemedicine guideline, this, uh, which has been brought about by BOG, we are very thankful that nation has it as a practicing dermatologist. All of us have been, uh, I can say that all doctors, uh, whatever specialty, they have been issuing prescriptions on the sly, on the overt, uh, via WhatsApp, by this thing. So this document gives every such consult a meaning. It's, it's a very good beginning for the country. You know, and now we have to, we learn as we go, we will modify our version one, two, three, four, five as we go. But uh, there, there's so much to look forward to. There's so much hope now. And I think our country and as a nation will be better off with uh, these considerations. The very fact that we are discussing now in such a meeting, uh, it's itself an opportunity to brainstorm and uh, imbibe new ideas for us. Thank you, Dr. Atal. It's so reckoning to know that and reassuring to know that um, somebody such as yourself is at the NABH is looking at this and you're going to come out with the standards and there will be a reference document that everyone could refer to and we really look forward to this and look forward to contributing even through these consultations, the best practices that we can collate. Thank you so much for that. I would like to request Dr. Sita Rama, who has been working with the states in implementing telemedicine at the state level and would like to understand from him some of the practical implications of how do you implement at the state? What is the capacity at the state level when you're looking at a primary healthcare center or when we're looking at uh, um, um, district health, uh, district hospital, what is the capacity that is there and how do we uh, implement this whole of a telehealth approach? Dr. Sitarama? Thank you, Mr. John. Uh, from Tata's side, I hope you are able to see me and hear me. Yes, 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 we can. Yeah, yeah. from Tata Trust side, we have done uh, three different types of telemedicine projects across the country over the last three, four years. Uh, one is uh, in collaboration with a trust hospital that is Ramakrishna Mission Hospital in Brindavan, UP, uh, wherein we collaborated with the hospital as a hub where we can refer all the cases that come through the telemedicine. We had spokes established in 20, 25 villages uh, around the place and the hub at the telemedicine center. Here it is also supported by a mobile medical unit so that some of the cases can be reached out to the medical units where they can take care. So that model worked very well because of the accessibility was a core issue in that area uh, and also the out-of-pocket expenses. They helped a lot in minimizing the out-of-pocket expenses and uh, accessibility aspects. So other... Uh, beautiful model that worked with the government is in Telangana, where we have started in connecting the primary health centers with a hub based out of Hyderabad. The primary health centers, they are staffed with doctors, but not always. For different reasons, sometimes doctors may not be available. So the typical reason for not using a PHC by the public is non-availability of the doctors. So this actually helped a lot because when a patient goes there, the nurse immediately connects the patient or a, a teleconference with the doctor sitting in Hyderabad. So there's a face-to-face -face interaction and some of the basic vitals are taken by the nurse and passed on to the doctor. And uh, to our surprise, the people are very happy. Patient satisfaction rate was very high. 
and there was a, a mini a simplified electronic medical record so that when the patient visits next time the doctor is able to read out what is the patient's condition in fact that satisfied the patients most because they they were very happy that the doctor knew already about my problem and the acceptance of both the electronic health record as well as the telemedicine project was very high based on this experience the government asked us to do something in the urban areas as well so in the urban health centers of hyderabad city what we called the basti dawakhanas wherein there is a doctor but the patients who required a specialist treatment consultation say because there was overcrowding of the tertiary care hospitals and there as far as some silly complaints also patients go to a specialist in a government hospital so to avoid that problem in the morning time when the doctor sees a patient she schedules in the afternoon consultation appointments with a specialist based out of a district hospital or usmania hospital a general hospital so as at the given time the patient comes and the doctor is there as an interface between the specialist and the patient so the patient asks some questions the doctor asks some questions and in between the doctor takes some additional help from the specialist and once the specialist gives his prescription and advice the doctor reads it explains it to the patient and ensures that there is a compliance so this is also a very good model that works particularly with certain specialties like internal medicine and dermatology so it helped a lot in uh, decongesting the dermatology opds and internal medicine opds in the general hospital so this is the model which worked very well and to our satisfaction during the uh, we are also doing a pan india non communicable disease project in government uh, in to support the government of india so through that we have already uh, say 130 million patients have people have been enrolled into the app and around uh, 4 million people have been uh, screened and so those people who have been screened and then referred to a primary health center or to a hospital and who have been confirmed with a particular non communicable disease this is there in the record so in what in telangana what they did is they had the line listing of the cases then the centers used to call those people and ask them inquire them about how compliant they are they are about the medications and uh, is there adequate supply of the medications at their primary health centers and all those details then they were passing on this information to the government supplies department so that there is a supply of the medications and there is a compliance with uh, treatment so this is also uh, worked very well and then during this covid era they requested us to help with the covid management as well so the government has added additional doctors and staff to this uh, center what we call the coordination center and this uh, the, there are home isolated isolation cases of covid so there are about 10000 to such people in the twin cities so we used to ask these people all their uh, numbers and details of their available with the staff here every day we have to call or the staff used to call them and inquire how they are what are, is there any additional problems in them and they are also given this toll free number they are at uh, liberty to call this center and another important feature of it is uh, to this project is this uh, tele consultation center was connected to 108 that is emergency ambulance care so during our interaction with the home, home isolated patient whenever we suspected that things are going bad then we used to call the 108 number and they used to go and pick up the patient and get them admitted so this is how different ways it worked well so the example i gave for vrindavan is with a, a non governmental charity hospital and in telangana it is a governmental setup and another model we tried in andhra that is in vijayawada where it is purely private model we established uh, a hub in vijayawada with doctors and 20 spots around that 50 to 100 kilometers radius of the city where in those villages there is a nurse there is a pharmacist and the pgp people whenever they go and these are all connected with the medical devices so all the vitals the doctor is able to see from here ecg they is to take and is to see here and uh, most of these devices were set up there and there is again the patient acceptance was very good and we also tried it as a revenue model so we used to give the medications at the non profit basis so people were getting medications at 60 to 70% of the market price that made a huge difference in the acceptance 
then we started labs so labs are also on the non profit basis so the on the non profit model the, we had adequate uh, revenues to support the project and so these are the three different models we worked in telemedicine which all worked well and uh, they, they so came out with a good proof of concept now we like uh, even any people who like to learn from us or to improvise these models we are very happy to will be very happy to share our experiences and maybe other governments or other agencies can take some important cues from this so Thank these are the three basic models where uh, we tried telemedicine to our satisfaction thank you thank for thank sharing you dr that. Uh, yeah go ahead to respond and i'm again opening this up i opened up first with dr tandon some queries dr sitarama thank you for your you know for sharing all that i really appreciate that the thing is uh, you know there are two parts that come up here one is uh, sustainability or the uh, profitability or you know i mean coming from a non profit uh, sector you would call it sustainability if i am from for profit i would say does it take money at the end so i think that part i still think is a challenge because we ourselves ran about 20 centers in rajasthan and two in northeast we found that the patients acceptance of telemedicine is very high but the payment issue is still i think a little gray we need to understand that i'd like to open that up later for discussion because doctors and especially specialists they're giving time so they expect to be compensated and where is that compensation going to happen and how is it going to happen is one challenge that i think we are facing and the second piece is uh, i'm not so sure and i would like dr tandon to come in at some stage is you know this whole business of giving consults on tele on telephone under the mci guidelines there are four things that came up very clearly i you know consent of the patient identifying yourself number 3 ensuring that the record is maintained number 4 uh prescriptions are legal now these are all legal requirements unfortunately a lot of people have uh, thought that you know we can go on calls and whatsapps and you know manage this whole consult piece on that and these three areas or four areas are neglected eventually this can be a major problem for the providers that is the doctors and the hospitals so i would like us to you know think about that i mean i mean I, there is one is level is convenience and the cost at the other level is actual legality you know you have to go by some standard some regulation and somewhere we have to balance it out together so maybe sometime you know in the next 15 20 minutes we would request dr tandon maybe dr atul to shed some light i want all the panelists to go through but i'm just raising some of these queries so that they get addressed later thank you so much dr sitaram thank you thank you thank you uh, i would like to ask Uh, Dr. Lewis to share because she's also wanted to answer this one question that has come up about what are the most difficult barriers to implementing telemedicine. We heard three models that Tata Trust have done and they seem to be very happy with the results and uh, the model is scaling up. But there are there on the flip side there are barriers as well. Dr. Lewis, what are some of the barriers that you have faced and how could those barriers be overcome when you want to do a large telehealth ecosystem in a country such as India? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um and to be honest, I really appreciate being here. Uh but I think that uh India has a lot to teach the rest of the world about telehealth and telemedicine. Um years ago, it was probably close to 10 years ago, uh Dr. Krishnan uh, Ganapathy came over to Australia and he gave us a presentation at our telehealth event and I still remember the the people in the audience just, you know, mouths open going you're doing what <laughs> um and and the reason that you know some of the stories that he relayed all those years ago which seemed quite incredible to an australian audience was because um in australia um important things like regulation and standards which by the way we have not solved those issues but they are important things um but sometimes they can be used as an excuse not to do things um and certainly not to do things at scale uh whereas some of the examples uh that uh, that you guys have even said today in this panel let alone what i heard 10 years ago is because i think there seems to be uh my ex uh looking outside in to india seems that you guys have a, a culture of just getting things done um and of course because of your geography and the huge number of people that you have in india 
you don't really have a choice. You have to get things done. You have to have that culture of, uh, you know, we don't see the barriers, we just see the opportunities and how can we collaborate and work together? Um, so I just wanted to say that, uh, that uh, yes, I'm certainly not here as an expert to teach you what we're doing in Australia. I think we can uh, learn a lot from cells. Um, but in terms of the barriers, uh, which can be universal or just at different scales, um, certainly the financial barriers are a problem. Um, they are a significant problem here in Australia, uh, where uh, particularly in primary care, uh, which is funded through government, that I can see someone on telehealth and pay for it fully out of my own pocket. But, um, but that, that opportunity is not there because most of the clinicians want uh, to they get paid via, via a government insurance system as well called MBS. Um, COVID happened, of course, um, as we're all living through. And uh, within the matter of three weeks, um, all of a sudden telehealth being paid from or subs um, subsidised from the government was available universally throughout Australia, whether you saw a general practitioner, a physiotherapist, a nurse. So we had this like huge lifting of these financial restrictions that had been in place. Um, however, uh, uh, Australia has just wound back some of those uh, and happy to talk about the detail of that if anyone's interested. Um, but one of the reasons that the financial uh, opportunities got rolled back somewhat in Australia is because of a cultural issue as well. So you're looking at uh, business models uh, in terms of how we deliver healthcare, who pays for it, how does, it, how does the work actually get done. Uh, that um, gets completely flipped on its head when you're talking about being able to do virtual and to be able to do virtual at scale. So I think one of the things, and this is challenging, we, we had a, I, had, I was in a meeting earlier today with American representatives and Canadian representatives, and they shared the same stories that everyone seems to like, yep, great, we can do telehealth and virtual care now at scale, that's great. Um, but we've been doing that for a few months now. And now everyone wants to take a breather and think, okay, look, we had to act quickly. And thank goodness, we were able to do that. Um, but there's a lot of things that we can do better. And we can learn from what's happened in the pandemic. Um, and I think that is, uh, you know, those structural barriers, but there are also cultural ones as well. And making sure that we, this is a journey that we take uh, clinicians on and hopefully we have more and more clinicians actually leading the charge. Uh, so anyway, there's a, there's a quick summary for you. I'm happy to, if anyone's got any questions on that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Luis. That was uh, very nicely said. And that again opens another area that I would like to talk about, which is, See, some of us are concerned that in India we are sort of, you know, uh, aping some other countries' models, especially, you know, getting influenced by the U.S. healthcare model. Now, uh, in, with respect to telemedicine, uh, what we have learned is that uh, in the U.S. healthcare, it was the, the tech guys who were actually leading the telemedicine piece. The healthcare providers were just sort of there. And, uh, and therefore, uh, whatever, I mean, there were problems that were happening because of acceptance by healthcare providers and the patients. Do you think uh, somewhere we should lead this actually? Is it a healthcare issue or is it a tech issue? So at the end of the day, in my opinion, the patient wants to get treated, right? They want care. And usually technology per se is just a tool. You know, yeah, if I have a laparoscopic surgeon, the laparoscope doesn't tell me how to operate, right? I use the laparoscope to operate. So similarly, uh, somewhere I think uh, we have, uh, as healthcare providers, sort of conceded the ground for implementation to the tech people. And I think there is a warning there. And you know, I would like to listen more to people to talk about you know, who leads this. Can I answer quickly? Because I love sure. that question. <laughs> Thanks, Shanoi. Um, uh, I agree completely with what you said. Um, and even outside of telehealth and virtual care, we know, and there's global evidence of the billions of dollars that um, that it doesn't get spent um, or deliver the outcomes that right. the original people who sign off on all of that money expects. Um, and that's because too often still after all of this time of doing digital health or health IT or e-health, um, 
if projects are not clinically led and if they're led with an IT hat, it just doesn't work. And, um, and that is probably quite unusual compared to other industries, but it's because again of the culture of healthcare and what our business is all about. So I agree with you completely. Um, and I'd just add one other thing, and yeah, I'd be interested to see what um, the rest of you think as well. Um, and that is clinical led is absolutely important. Um, when something, when we're talking about telehealth and virtual care, I think there's an equal part of leadership to play um, from patients and from, from consumers, whatever, whatever language you like. Um, because at least here, we find that the majority of uh, consumers, patients have no idea that this is an option. Um, and, and now they do because they were told about it because of the pandemic, there was no other choice. Um, but then a lot of them would have had because to scale so quickly and not even have the technology and the training and the education in place, a lot of those consumers are going to report really bad experiences, you know, waiting around for ages for the, I thought it was at 11, it's 1.30, no one's called me yet, um, the technology doesn't work, like all of these things that could happen. And so I think there's a real role to play for patients and consumers um, and, and clinicians should be advocates for that too, in actually uh, them leading the charge as well. And uh, so anyway, I'd be keen to hear what others think. And thanks Thank for the you. great question, Thank Shanoi. Mark, uh, would you like to share uh, on this specific question that came about who should actually put together this whole thing? So would it be a country that would take responsibility, a state that would take responsibility? And you've been working on uh, developing capacity at national levels in uh, both in terms of a digital health architecture as well as scale up of telemedicine in the regional countries. So um, over to you, Mark, to share some light on this. Great, thanks. Thanks, Uman. And just to build on what Luisa said, I mean, I absolutely agree. It has to be driven from the clinicians, from the users, including the patient or beneficiaries as well. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of experience and examples of this where it has worked and where it hasn't. And, uh, you know, just to, just to draw on, uh, for example, in Bhutan, where uh, here you had a national re uh, ref referral hospital that uh, the government put in a uh, telemedicine program without any inputs at first from the, the clinicians, physicians, et cetera. And uh, it, it just didn't work. And there was a re real reluctance to make time to go into the telemedicine theater and sit and, and, and take calls and, and uh, video and stream um, and do consultations, et cetera. Uh, so it was only when they st stopped the, the process and stepped back and found ways that could work for them uh, and uh, you know, made some adjustments in terms of policies, but more importantly, uh, figured out ways where they could uh, you know, have some rotations and have ways to uh, incentivize uh, the specialists in particular to be part of that, that initiative. Um, and then, then I can say just from my own experience in this COVID-19 and working with our pediatrician, and uh, you know, at, at the same time, I think we have to be sensitive to uh, providers and clinicians, their uh, messaging fatigue, just because you have your doctor's WhatsApp number uh, doesn't mean that we have the right as a patient or on behalf of our child to, uh, you know, send multiple messages and expect an answer uh, at, at free of charge at no cost. Uh, and, and so there has to be boundaries as well that providers place on this. And, and these are some of the learning by doing kind of uh, experiences that we have. Uh, so in the case that I'm sharing from my own personal experience is you know, having a prepayment scheme through Paytm or some other mechanism uh, before that consultation is set up. Uh, but, you know, I, I think from what we've heard from colleagues already on the call that one size doesn't fit all, but we have to understand the context, understand uh, what, what culturally works, what are some of the, the rules and behaviors of engagement, uh, and, 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 and make those very explicit. Um, and so I, I think as we go along in this discussion, as we think about how to think about accreditation programs from the provider side, but also, uh, you know, having some of the, the, the policies and procedures uh, for those that want to avail of these services um, and, and, and learn as we go. But as, as, as we're pointing out already that whether in, in India or, you know, all across the world, we're still learning uh, how to do this better and better uh, from the experience uh, going forward. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you uh, Mark. Uh, yeah, sure. Oman, go ahead. Because I wanted to actually put this across to Dr. Tundan. He's been 
I'm waiting to answer a couple of queries that I raised. But go yeah, ahead. Yeah, sure, sure. Why don't you? Why don't you ask? Uh, Dr. I saw him, uh, you know, because when we are talking about who's going to lead this, and you know about regulation, I think there are quite a few questions that probably Dr. Tandon was very would be interested in you know, engaging with. Um, so, so let me address the, the leading business. Uh, I, I think I, I would actually concur with everything that's been said, right? Um, the really, the two primary stakeholders are the patient and the person or persons or institutions who deliver the care, right? I mean, so doctors and the paraphernalia, right? So, that, so those, those really have to be leading this, right? Clearly, they may not be able to understand the, techno the technological nuances. They may not understand what is required. But I think that's an area which that means unless that is an active part of discussion with the technology platform providers from the very beginning, this is not going to be a worthwhile exercise. And if I, I look at, and this is hearsay, so you can always challenge what I'm saying, but I talk to all my friends and colleagues who, who work out of electronic health records in the U.S., every one of them complains bitterly about those electronic health records. <laughs> now they work brilliantly for some part of the administrative requirements for the hospital. I'm not, question, I'm not saying they're useless, but they, they possibly meet a lot of the, a lot, check a lot of boxes for the administrative part. I think they check a lot of boxes for the finance part, right? So billing works brilliantly with a lot of them. But actually, you know, asking a patient who is hospitalized, whom you ask the same question the day before, do you smoke? And you, the person says no. And then the first post-operative day, you ask the same question, do you smoke? Now, really, the guy didn't have a chance to pick up smoking, right, while he was inside yeah. hospital. So, so there, I, mean, <laughs> I know it's, a, it's an absolutely facetious example, but it happens all the time, right? So uh, they, they delivered a job. They thought they were doing an um, administrative piece. They thought they were doing a budgeting or a finance piece, but they forgot that the central part of this is the patient and everything required to help the patient. And, and obviously as a medical professional, I'd love to see myself sent to stage there and not everybody else. And that's the reality of things. So I, I think there's a plethora of platforms which are now coming up, but they seem to be saying that we've made this platform. Now you adjust your practice to meet the technology that we prepared, which I think is a really, really awful way of doing things. So, I mean, that answers, as far as I'm concerned, I, you can see it's a biased and a conflicted answer because I'm wearing my clinician's hat there. But that's my answer to that. C could you repeat the second Thank question? you, Dr. Tandon. I just respond to that. I have been, a, I, I am a clinician. I've also been a hospital administrator, led hospital chains. And uh, everywhere where we had this, so people believe that I bring in an HIS or a tele, now it's telemedicine, the whole game will change. See, they don't understand that there is something called behavioral change and change management, which is critical. And uh, you can't expect a doctor at, after 25, 30 years of doing things in a certain manner to change them dramatically. Uh, and there's a, so much pain that is expressed, especially in the US healthcare, where doctors tell these guys, please come and work with me for 24 to 48 hours, see how I manage my patients, and then build something around that. So to your point, very rightly said. The other question was basically, I think what I talked about was, uh, one was this whole uh, regulation business. So, you know, uh, MCI regulates us, doctors. Uh, EH, uh, sorry, the Clinical Establishments Act, again, is, is, uh, regulates us, hospital managers, or hospital CEOs, hospitals. And then we have the quality, which protects the patient's interest, which is, again, attributable only to the NABL and the NABH. And then we have this whole bunch of people who are saying that we are aggregators. Uh, I am just uh, yellow pages. I am a pharmacy, although I'm using technology to provide meds. Uh, whose jurisdiction do they come under, although they pretend to be giving healthcare? So I think that's a great question, and I'm, I'm glad this is being raised. Uh, I'll also confess at the very outset that I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no, I mean, let's be very clear on that. However, let me also give you an example. We sometimes think of, think of these things rather late, and I'm very happy, and I was delighted to hear Dr. Kocher when he said, you know, that they're doing all these consultations, because I'm extremely hopeful that those consultations will help guide us as a nation as to how to proceed. But I, I'm, I'm going to give you a con an example. So you have the, 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 um, the Drug Controller General who, who does sort of, who regulates drugs, Devices was not under the control of anybody for like 
decades, right? right. So, you know, things like stents, things like glucometers, things, none of these, they were falling between stools. But I'm very, very glad that this is now a matter of conversation. And uh, we would love to see the end of that consultation. And I'm sure Dr. Kocha will be kind enough to share uh, that report with the MCI or the National Medical Council, whatever is in place by the time the consultation is over. And I think we really need to take this forward because it's not, because if you have a rogue player in the pack, you might then end up with, you know, vitiating the entire environment for that. And technology should be there as an able assistant, but not somebody who's really, uh, you know, sitting in the driver's seat for this. I think you brought a very important point, and I think uh, just just supporting it, rogue agents can actually destroy the credibility of the of the telemedicine piece itself, both with the doctors and with the patients. So that I think is very very nicely put. Thank you for for bringing that point up. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sitarama. I just want to check with you. See, you've had experience in implementing this in some of the states. So did you come across this as a challenge? in terms of the capacity for the system to absorb, primarily, uh, primarily at the primary healthcare center, district hospitals like you yourself meant and uh, mentioned. Uh, and how, how did you overcome those ones? Uh, yes, sir. It was a reasonably easy task to improve the capacities because even in the government system, most of the doctors, nurses, they are, uh, these days they are too quick to grasp the techy details. Also, the teams that provide hardware, software, they're also very good. And uh, we have a, a good pool of people, both IT side also in the country right now. They are available at a, not at a, not in an exorbitant cost. They are easily available and they are doing good jobs. And when you think about capacities, it is not only the capacities of the doctors and nurses and pharmacists, etc. There are a lot of people who have to coordinate all these telemedicine activities, like uh, field supervisors, field executives, and also administrators and financial people. So they, they, they have to be trained, but it's not a big deal. We didn't come across any big hurdles in uh, training the people in these areas. Uh, I don't think it's a major challenge, but we have to keep in mind that you need to train different categories of people. Uh, not just doctors or nurses, uh, we have to do the capacity business. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Doctor Atul, my question to you is, um, we see a lot of reports saying that electronic health records are actually helpful in improving outcomes, measuring outcomes. And uh, however, from our experience in India, it's not really used for that, right? So uh, as somebody who's been a passionate advocate of improving health outcomes and yourself leading this whole thing from uh, the um, NABH. Uh, where do you see, well, on one hand, we have telehealth platforms coming up, but we don't see too many of them actually uh, putting together this longitudinal health record like uh, Professor Tandon mentioned. So if it is somebody with chronic diseases and you're seeing him after three months, six months, nine months or 12 months, you would need to see a comprehensive view of that. And so in, level, in, in terms of maturity of where we are on electronic health records and what is your vision as somebody who's really advocating improving quality in the country, both from, from terms of telemedicine as it's going forward, as well as uh, where you see this uh, move and what might be some of the accelerators from your perspective that could be leveraged to achieve this? Yeah, Dr. Oman, that's a fantastic uh, question actually. And what uh, Professor Nikhil Tandon also said, actually, the time uh, we had to come in, these are uncertain times and the document had to be produced into a public domain. Uh, so it was produced. I mean, so, I mean, there was so much work going on and maybe the pandemic only slightly accelerated the launch period and very rightly so. And uh, at a right opportune moment, it is now in the public domain. Right. So these standards now have to be built upon this solid foundation of uh, uh, the guidelines which have now come. And all these questions which you've just raised will be uh, have to be answered or created or new questions uh, looked into and new answers found. So that is one angle. Now talking about the horizontal health, the outcome-based monitoring, that itself is a challenge currently. 
So what we have to do is to uh, uh, really capture the data in a particular format. Just because somebody is exposing himself or herself to a tele uh, consult does not mean that data is out in the open. That data is very precious. And same rules of the law, the rules of the land apply to that patient also, that consultation also, and, and they will remain there. And maybe new problems will also crop up. So we have the best uh, uh, legal experts uh, as Professor Tan said, uh, we we have looking into the fact they're part of that thing. We have uh, nominee, nominations from Drug Control General of uh, India's office also, who is uh, uh, we are discussing and deliberating all these aspects. And we are uh, primarily subdivided into information, like what data to capture, what to translate, like a patient goes from one doctor to another. So what data should mandatorily uh, crossover without the consent of the patient and what should require a patient's consent to be transferred over. So we are deliberating that. Uh, uh, so that is part of the information, then privacy of the data, the security of the data, and, and ultimately uh, the interoperability. Suppose you cross border, then what, uh, what uh, data should cross borders, if at all? There are rules, for example, Germany very explicitly uh, prohibits the uh, transfer of data and these current telemedicine guidelines also currently do not uh, favor a transborder consult so so we are also developing and over time these will be developed to a larger extent our only point is that with technology uh, comes a, a lot of responsibility and and uh, going by that book called bad blood and the uh, theranos i mean that's my favorite actually so so anything wrong i mean you you keep uh, dr shinoy uh, talked about uh, rogue players so I, I, at at present i may not label them as rogue because i believe everyone is just stepping up to be counted everyone is just stepping up uh, to give their best in these challenging times because there's a need for a telemedicine which they all platforms came up and fulfilled in whatsoever minimum way so they all are contributing uh, this thing but the idea as dr louis also said as mark also said is to develop regional customized solutions for your own kind of people because behavioral change will take time to uh, you know implement it may take decades to implement but uh, there's lots of hope and uh, with that behavioral change, uh, we have to also see what people take it. I mean, we have to take technology to people. And I suffer from the same conflicts being a clinician as uh, uh, Professor Tandon and uh, Professor uh, Dr. Robinson, that uh, uh, ultimately clinicians will, will have to devise uh, ways of uh, transferring empathy also, you know, with the 4D, 5D, 6D coming, because these are certain challenges also. I mean, how to win the trust of the patient? actually across the screen, but the technology is so wonderful that the immersive uh, uh, methodologies which are coming in, it's, it's as good as uh, seeing a small hair pore on the uh, skin. I mean, so with that kind of technology with 4G, 5G, 6G, 10G coming in uh, eventually, and uh, these platforms being made available. So it's all about uh, going into the Atmanirbhar mode and creating some indigenous customized solutions, which will address all these uh, possibilities. So, uh, so there's lots of hope, actually. There's a good beginning which has been made. And going forward, uh, the version 1 can go on to the moon, you know, 1.2, 1.10. I mean, so, so that 1 was very essential. So that 1 is now in public domain. And, and we will place all our consults, uh, Dr. Tandon, sir, we will place all these for public consultation. We'll reach out to you, rather. I mean, we will reach out to experts like you uh, with a draft document, seek more suggestion, go back to drawing board again if need be, and then improve till we have, and we hope to do it by the year end, actually. We are very confident that a basic standard uh, document is placed in public domain uh, uh, by the year end so that there is a some structure and, and too many people are working just like uh, our BOGs and NMC uh, by 24th September, whatever the result is. Uh, so we are very hopeful about uh, this discussion and going forward. Thank you so thank much. You, thank, thank you, Dr. Dr. Kocher. Uh, so just uh, responding to what you said and building on what you said, you talked about data security, which is very critical, right? One of the most important parts, which is being neglected. Now, uh, <clears throat> who owns the data? Good question, right? Is it the patient? Is it the doctor? Is it the hospital? Is it the insurance company? Um, whoever. So we still have that debate going on. I don't, I would like to open that up if required. But more importantly, what is current for us is that there are 
so called telemedicine providers today who are providing telemedicine services free of cost some of them are sponsored by pharma to doctors uh there is a gray area there which says that you know why would anybody give you free medicine a free telemedicine is it to collect data and then use it i don't want to use the word misuse it but use the data right at least the data is precious so is there a requirement to somehow or other manage this also uh, it's a question that i think needs to be addressed by all of us that is somebody is giving a free platform uh, my experience says there's no free lunch i mean at the end of the day somebody's got to pay for it somebody's got to make something out of it right so it's blatant if you are saying i'm giving you free uh, you know telemedicine now just give me the data and manage the rest and no that's a wonderful point yeah, that's a point actually point. using it so again the questions that start to start coming up are as you yeah. said rightly what is version 1.2 1.3 and i think uh, we will that's why this uh, discussion is happening what's next uh, what is a business model so when doctors ask me somebody is giving me free so i tell them look look at the business model here if the guy is not making money from anywhere and he's still spending out of his pocket then probably he's got to do something with your data right nobody is just charity here so those are some of the questions that i would like some of us to answer in case uh, there is a no so i i totally agree these are wonderful points and uh, i think authorities uh, are already in know of these points the entire spectrum is mapped out the national digital health mission and the national digital health blueprint is a wonderful document which is in public domain uh, they are already i mean as soon as 15 days from now the 15th of august you would be aware government is launching its uh, uh, health facility registry so uh, that's that's also in public domain so from 15th of august uh, health facility uh, registry is being launched in seven union territories So, which is a very ambitious and a very thoughtful project of National Health Authority, which is going to come, and ultimately they are uh, that document which covers a spectrum of five years, uh, active in active collaboration with NITI, uh, with active collaboration with Health Authority under the direct supervision of Ministry and uh, Honourable Prime Minister of India. So that is a wonderful document which is uh, there, and that clearly map maps out all our concerns. so over time it lays down a very clear road map of what is going to come over the next 5 years uh, so over the next 5 years we can expect to answer obviously these like i said like this pandemic the global pandemic uh, what it stands for it, it has been a disaster of uh, uh, immense magnitude i mean immeasurable magnitude so Uh, i mean the idea was to start somewhere so that everybody can contribute in howsoever way now the time will be there to plug all these loopholes which you very rightly pointed out and the hfr uh, the health facility registry is the first step it addresses all the data linkages it addresses all the cooperations the storage of data and ultimately it addresses all points all points we are working together on taking digital health i mean to the next level beyond telehealth so tele consultation is a uh, kind of a low hanging fruit of a big tree but, but the rest of the tree also has to be looked out and there are n number of branches uh, uh, looking into the legal aspects the data like we have been keep uh, talking of all of us are talking so there are lots of uh, promise for the future and lots of i think authorities have already considered that and 15 years uh, 15 days from now we will know what what the launch is then uh, the seven union territories starting from puducherry and other they they will start assembling so so there are lots of uh, work going on so so lots of uh, people at a higher level are uh, thinking and contributing and implementing and uh, maybe uh, all of us will be wiser very soon Great, uh, thank you, Dr. Atul. I want to ask Mark. Mark, you've been uh, very closely looking at uh, national digital health architectures, and like Dr. Atul said, so if we were to have a tree with a lot of fruits, you need to have the roots as well. So, what are some some of the basic fundamental principles that uh, would need to be considered uh, right at the beginning? Because as you heard, we have uh, parallel streams of activities that are going on, and you know, Where do you see uh, uh, blueprint, uh, the blueprint, and from from a strategic point of view, from the WHO guidance as well? Mark, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Simon. And, and just to build on what uh, Dr. O'Toole has said, uh, and I think everybody in the panel and everybody listening will understand, 
telemedicine can't be implemented in isolation from so much uh, ongoing uh, activity in the digital health space. And, uh, you know, other things that we have to think about in the Indian context is, uh, you know, aligning with the national health stack from the Ayog, uh, you know, the unique health ID scheme from uh, PMJY. Uh, so, so these are all uh, building blocks. So you, you've got lots of entities uh, within the ministry and, and even the private sector uh, implementing different components of digital uh, in the health space. And having that blueprint, that architecture blueprint, uh, is certainly part of the, the uh, way forward to look at the uh, current state or the as-is architecture, if you will, and then what, what should the future state look like? And so I think the, the national e-health architecture blueprint uh, that's been put up here in India is, is a very good example of the way to uh, bring all this together. And uh, you know, as we work with, with member countries in our region, and of course as WHO, uh, you know, building on from a normative standpoint, uh, looking at the appropriate standards uh, to promote interoperability, uh, looking at some of the, the infrastructure requirements to support uh, sustainability and scaling up uh, of what works. Uh, you know, we often uh, get very excited when we see a pilot activity whether it's telemedicine or otherwise, working so well in um, some of the hard, hardest to reach uh, areas, perhaps say in Bihar, for example, in this country, and the work of MoTeC that was supported by uh, a, a philanthropic foundation, for example. Um, it, it's very hard to scale and, and, and sustain these investments if they are not adhering to a, a common uh, vision uh, as well as a, a blueprint. And, and looking at all of the uh, building blocks that are necessary there. Um, so I, I, I think for, for this to succeed, there has to be some level of autonomy because here in India, of course, uh, health is a state subject, uh, but there also has to be some compliance with some SOPs, uh, some policies, uh, regulatory requirements have to be adhered to, uh, and of course, uh, compliance with that architecture. Uh, so I, I think that's clearly the mandate of the, the, uh, the new national digital health mission. Uh, and, and, and I really do find a lot of, um, I think, appreciation to see how this has been supported as an extension of the National Health Authority, because it means that it's not going to be an IT driven, it shouldn't be an IT driven endeavor, but it really needs to be driven by public health and all of the uh, cl clinical aspects, as well as all of the, the, the user aspects that need to drive that going forward. So, uh, you know, of course, there's a lot of principles and, and practices that can be drawn from. And I, what, I, what I really do appreciate and, and have observed here in India is, is doing it right and not rushed. And I, I think that's what I see is, is going to be the hallmark of success here in India is the way that the country is going about it uh, very, very deliberately and strategically uh, because there has been a proliferation of digital health. Uh, so I see the telemedicine aspect kind of nesting in a, a more uh, sustainable architecture uh, going forward to make it really sustainable as part of the new norm. So uh, there has been a few questions answered asked by the audience uh, and I'm also getting some WhatsApp messages and I just like to sum it together. Uh, when Dr. Atul was talking about uh, digital stack, uh, you know, the, what the government is doing and, uh, and then there were other tech people, they, questions that came up again were, who's looking after the clinician's interest and who's looking after the patient's interest? How are we involving them in these, uh, you know, these very tech uh, sounding uh, pieces, you know, a national health stack. Now, frankly speaking, if I ask 99% of my clinical colleagues, they won't have a clue what national health stack is. I mean, between us, I'm just, just being. So are we using the clinician, the user's perspective? That's why we started this series, you know, these roundtables with the users, where we brought in doctors and we brought in patient uh, advocacy groups uh, in, in one place and, and hospital owners. So uh, the concern that I see among, again, is how are we going to involve them? Or, or not, and then next will be to involve them, we need to educate them. So, uh, I mean, there are no answers, I understand that, but. Maybe it's things that we could consider some of us when we are discussing in our, in our boardrooms and in, in, our, you know, in our conference day, conference rooms. Perhaps so, we could ask uh, Dr. Lewis because I think- from, Yeah, she's got experience. Maybe that will be good. Yes. Yeah. 
So, Clues, would course. you want to share something, some of your experience in this space of how you have taken inputs from uh, customers or clients, as you call it, and engaging them in the whole process of this co-design of what really are solutions that might be relevant uh, for everyone? Yeah, Dr. Luis, you very clearly said there is a patient and there is a provider, a doctor, or it could be a nurse, could be anybody else, and rest is all you know, noise. But can we just reduce the noise and make sure that these two people are heard? Once you've got a prescription to reduce the noise, you could like capitalize and sell that and make a fortune, <laughs> pay for healthcare for everybody. Um, so, no, look, thank you for asking me the question. And uh, like, I think it sounds like we're all on very similar pages here. Um, and I noticed some, there's been questions in the chat as well, looking at including family and caregivers as well in this process. Um, so, I think that to reduce the noise, you have to, you know, that KISS principle, the keep it, stu keep it simple, stupid. Um, idea. So if we really look at, look, what are we trying to achieve and what's the best way to get there in a timely fashion um, and echoing uh, other points that panellists have made as well about, you know, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. What do we need to do right now? Um, so just as an example of how you can do this quite quickly, we've got a health service in Queensland and, um, and you know, just like everyone else around the world, you have to rapidly upscale. They were doing telehealth in sort of, I guess, more, more traditional fashion using, you know, quite expensive um, enterprise-wide equipment, which is only available in so many places. Now, um, the recognition of, well, hang on, we need to do this quickly most people have a phone a smartphone and what have they already got on there that they can use so um, they're the only health service that I know that have done this but it's really laudable and I'm, I can put a link in the chat uh, if people are interested so they put together guidelines so if you want to use Skype if you want to use WhatsApp you know, like, so various consumer grade technology. Um, and while, um, while there is an argument to have about is that the best option and the perfect option, if we've got to scale quickly, um, how do, and we, 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 we don't have time or the resources for an enterprise wide approach. So what's coming back to standards, which has also been discussed in this, you know, how can we make it easy for people? So what we need to do is look at, okay, what's the bare minimum standards to make sure that data is protected? How do we upskill the workforce? And how do we also get um, patients and consumers and caregivers there? Well, they've already got this device that they're quite familiar with. And most of those you know, um, apps that we use from a consumer basis are relatively user-friendly, including that's why Zoom is winning, um, is winning the work from home wars um, because their technology is just works and you can work it pretty easily. Um, so I completely agree that the best way to the best way to actually reduce that noise is looking at um, and, and I wouldn't want to comment uh, on how exactly it should work in India. But here, I think we would look at it from a service level perspective so that you can do it very quickly. Meanwhile, the government and the regulators can work together and they have to do it in collaboration with patients as well and have it clinical led to what do we need to do to get the best outcome for patients. So then we can, um, and that's certainly the approach Australia is taking. Um, something else that might be of interest is that with our body is uh, is the non you know we're a non-profit member organization which means we represent really diverse interests so we have gps we have nurses i'm an occupational therapist by training we have government and policy makers we have the technology providers um and academics so we have this really broad group and it is quite impossible to get everybody to agree but i can tell you what everybody does agree and that's where we're heading to that what we we can do a lot better and we need to do better about about having truly patient-centered care that really puts patients and what they, their needs are. Exactly how we get there and how we build that process, yes, is up for debate. But if everybody agrees with that principle and you start there, it makes it a lot easier. Um, so one of the things that we will be doing and we're launching it next week is we're building a, a volunteer-led community of anybody who is, if you're a member and you're interested in this stuff, we want to hear from you. And then we'll select a group of people out of, I imagine we might get hundreds of people responding to that request. Um, and so we'll you know get a representative group of people together um, and they will work on you know standards uh, well they'll, they'll 
they'll, the community will tell us what will, but I imagine standards will be part of it um, and other, other, uh, other position statements that they'll want to make as well. And that will be led by a co-design approach with various voices at the table and it won't be led by government and it won't be led by technology. It'll be led by the community because, um, with a principle of what's in the best interest for patients and not that we're telling patients, patients have told us that's what they need. Um, and uh, so that, that approach is, uh, is something that I, I am really positive will work uh, because it should remove the noise, it should remove the politics out of these things to really just focus on the core. Uh, so, and I'll, you know, stay in chat and <laughs> I'll keep you in the loop of how that goes, but we're certainly thinking that that should be a really positive approach. Thank you, Louise. Professor Tandon, would you like to reflect on uh, some of the specific questions that have come in terms of uh, the governance of the whole of the telehealth practice, uh, particularly because you are, you've been looking at this from very close quarters in, in terms of, and there have been a couple of questions around the health and wellness centers and the role of telehealth uh, in, in, in that context. So, so, you know, governance is a very broad word out here. Remember the first thing which, the first thing which is important to understand is that now there is a, there's a framework which you can refer to, right? And I think part of the reason why something like telemedicine, uh, the discussion got reactivated, this, the guidance document was made, et cetera, was also, um, you know, people saying, this is a service which is being provided, who's regulating the service? And what are the regulations under which we can gauge whether the due process is being followed or not? And I think, therefore, this is the very first step towards uh, that being done. Um, and uh, it, it, therefore, the second part, of course, being that it becomes by becoming part of the Indian Medical Council Act as an as an as an annexure as an amendment. It basically says that we opening another mechanism for a registered medical practitioner to deliver patient care or health care or even patient education. But it's it till now, we know you were doing it. We know it was rampant, but we hadn't really provided you with a something to refer back to and say, you know, I think this is what I should, what I'm planning to do. Is this right? Or will this invite the wrath of the authorities, right? You know, so I think that's the, really the first step which is happening out here. And um, that's critical because as, as was mentioned, there's certain things which, which are very clearly prescribed within the guidance document. Uh, Dr. Kocha referred to one thing that you know, the writ of an Indian medical practitioner runs within the geographical confines of India, right? So when somebody became a registered medical practitioner in India, he or she was really entitled to deliver care within India. So at the moment, you're really not expected to provide care outside the geographical confines using telemedicine, right? So, so, I mean, that's one example. Then the other example is what circumstances can you do new patient consultations? What are the sort of management and prescriptions that you can do for a new consultation as, expo as opposed to somebody who you've seen before? What can you do in an emergency situation? You know, because people might shy away from doing something in an emergency situation and, and waste very, very precious moments. So it starts discussions on all these points. Whether you want to call them governance, whether you want to call them regulation. I mean, that's, that's, it's at least a, a guidance there. And at least we've got something on a piece of paper, which you can refer to and say that, hang on, I think I might not be doing what I was expected to do. Let me take a step back and reconsider this. So that's, that's the governance part. In terms of extending that, and I'm going to just go to take this a bit further. How do I, as a medical practitioner, know what I'm supposed to be doing? I've never been taught this till now. And I think that becomes a very, very important part because patients may expect anything from you because they need help, but you need to be sure as to what you're entitled to provide. And therefore that part again becomes very critical as far as I'm concerned. And you need to therefore provide some sort of training. And eventually I would say, 
some sort of uh, uh, of certification and or accreditation for that over a period of time. Now that's work which has been initiated. If you look at the guidelines document, it does refer to the fact that that process will get established over the next three years. In the interim, people are supposed to follow what's written with the guidelines. I also anticipate, and maybe exceeding my brief out here, that eventually this should be as and when that, that coursework gets established, I think it should get us absorbed within the medical curriculum also. Because you know that's the easiest way of ensuring that all the new registered medical practitioners can get trained and, and acquainted with what's required. The accreditation program at the moment is um, really something for which the MCI and it's, so, so, so I think we also took a bit of a hiatus. We were doing some, we took a step back after it became notified through the Gazette. But, but in our meeting on the 15th of May, we've now started the process of uh, the Board of Governors meeting on the 15th of May. We have now started the process of developing that certification accreditation process. Uh, the responses, uh, this is a multi-tiered process which has been now established. The curriculum committee has been established as a first round to develop what are called the broad contours, right? So once there is, and that has already now been, so that's being, uh, this is being done through um, the Digital Health Academy, which is located at the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences in Bangalore. They've, uh, they, they've taken on this responsibility. It'll then go to a smaller group within the MCI Board of Governors. And then, of course, people will be co-opted. People will be called in who have different expertise to give their feedback. And eventually, after rounds of iteration, when the modules are prepared, all of that's going to be sifted, sieved, and approved and then get approved through the Board of Governors. So I think you know that process, just to reassure people that it has uh, become, it has been started. Um, I'm also gonna quickly jump because I see Mark's written a couple of things in a chat box. So th Mark, this is really, uh, uh, you asked about website manners and that's my first feedback when I got the curriculum document that there has to be an etiquette so you have bedside etiquette, you have to have website etiquette. You, re you really need to figure out, you're not just giving a prescription. That's not the start and end point. You're dealing with a human being and you've got to figure out what is the way of dealing with that human being. And there are huge behavioral issues which have to be brought in. And it's not merely saying, okay, ask these three questions. Uh, let that person show if he's got a skin rash on the face and prescribe an ointment. That's not what's expected. So you really, really need for people to, uh, to be able to understand that whole process of dealing with a person who's contacting you because they need your help. And that's the first thing before even medicine comes into play. With regards to telemedicine accreditation, the Medical Council of India, I think, will eventually play a role because it is, uh, it, it, it will, will have, it is supposed to look at the ethical aspects of the behavior of our registered medical practitioners. And if that behavior in sort of involves treating and dealing with patients through a digital medium, I think that has to be also looked at by a regulatory body, whatever the regulatory body may be. Uh, with the overall space, I think that's still under discussion as to what the entire space, because you yourself pointed out in the beginning that there are a huge number of different players in the game, and we need to define a mechanism by which all of them can be suitably uh, corralled into a cohesive unit so that the bottom line is that you need to deliver good quality care and we shouldn't in the process of, of, of convenience forsake some of the critical bits also. Thank you. I have a naughty question. Uh, sure. Slightly naughty. Uh, what telemedicine with, with lab aggregators, uh, online pharmacies, and yellow pages be considered as telemedicine providers? I'd like to open this up. So I'm, I'm going to sort of be very brief on this one. Uh, I, I think what you're really saying is we need to define a glossary of terms. We need to have definitions. We need to provide terms of reference. We need to really say, you know, for, your, for you to be called a registered medical practitioner, this is what you are. For you to be a telemedicine platform, this is what you need to fulfill. If you need, if, so all the service providers and all the players will really need to adhere to at least a modicum of, uh, of, of uh, you know, what their terms of reference are and what they should be providing. I mean, 
I, I think that's the first. I don't want to be over regulatory in this. I mean, I think I don't think that's the that's the principle. But remember, it's human lives eventually, which yes. are at stake. I mean, that's I, I, and nobody should forget that part of the whole thing. All of us chaps who are clinicians actually took an oath long time ago. That oath, whether it's in a physical contact or a digital contact, is very much in place. And if there is a likelihood of that oath getting vitiated because of a technical uh, a, a frailty, we still are responsible, right? And therefore, we must ensure that that technical framework is kept in a way that we are allowed to do what we signed up for, that is, look after human beings. Thank you. Would somebody else in the panel answer that question? I mean, somebody no, else. Problem, so, no, no, no. I mean, without going into that naughty thing, but I believe this is a <laughs> this is a fantastic summation by. Sorry, uh, what was, I, the reason I said naughty was I asked the same question in the previous panel, and uh, some people got a little offended by saying, "Yes, of course, we are providing convenience of lab tests online." So that's also no, telemedicine. These so are the I'm great hoping to understand. You know, is it telemedicine? No, no, these are the gray zones which experts will come in and answer because then there's not one shade or 50 shades, but I believe there are a million shades of gray between <laughs> uh, the initial and the last. But, but what uh, Dr. Tandon said makes so much sense, actually. Yeah, because a, this, is, this is the summation. The elephant in the room has been introduced, uh, given a formal shape and a structure, and we'll, we'll now go forward trying to make sense of the arms and legs and the trunk and uh, that kind of stuff. So, so going about the NABH path, I mean, I think that that's part of the earlier thing which I was uh, about to tell you what, what the role of patients. So drafting any standard is a very elaborate process, which Dr. Louis, also, Louis also said that voluntary group, which is there. So similarly, we bring in all the stakeholders. We bring in all people. We uh, bring in all uh, non-governmental bodies, all uh, medical associations. We consult with international counterparts. We take their opinion guidance, and then uh, we put it again in the public domain. So, and the consumer groups also come in. They suggest. Uh, so after elaborate discussion, their representation, their concerns are addressed. And then a final, very simple document, uh, like you said, the KISS principle, keep it simple uh, uh, kind of thing, which we, which we put it in the uh, public domain. And, and talking about architecture, I mean, our National Digital Health Mission and the Blueprint, they rely very heavily on free resources, the FIRE. The FHIR is there. Then we have HL7, we have GS1. And practically every concern concerning our telehealth has already been developed. Like Dr. Tandon uh, talked about uh, Digital Health Academy, which is part of e-health resource center in Bangalore, which is an arm of CDAC. So they are already on board with us. So, uh, and then there is a CDAC e-Sanjeevani project, which is working exclusively on devising the right and the correct way of taking consent and capturing the right e-prescription. So they are also part of us. So these people, we are just kind of the regulatory framework is already there. And we are there to collate that, uh, you know, kind of masticate that and put it uh, in a palatable format, in a tasty format, so that our um, average practitioner our average when i say average they're not average they are they are high up there all the doctors but uh, maybe technology they want it really simple they, they don't want another uh, book another learning material to go through so the course which also we developed as dr tan said over the time will be a very very user friendly taking care of what not to do to the patient because they understand what to see they are all experts what to see how to give a prescription they know that but what not to do what not to do with the data, what not to do, what framework to work and operate within, and answer questions such as yours, uh, what about any regulator? I mean, those things will uh, come out with lab aggregators and uh, platforms. So so it's, it's a learning experience for all of us. So that mm -hmm. elephant is now there, very well-defined shape, and uh, we hope to take it forward. And I really love that small uh, sculpture behind Dr. Luis, you know, that uh, there are two of them. Yeah, that, uh, and, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. And just, um, uh, just a comment on the naughty, which I love. Thank you. Um, but um, I, the, it's a lot about it. A lot of, we can answer that, some of that question if we start to look at um, defining um, in some cap capacity the low value versus high value um, and, and what's required. So, and that could be, you know, for this type of consultation, 
is a phone okay? Like if, if I get a phone call from my clinician um, or, or actually does it really need to include video? Um, so I'm not sure what's happened in India, but uh, I'd love to find out from you guys. But certainly in Australia, we've had this massive increase in telehealth, which is great. Um, and when it was announced, it was supposed to the idea, the, the concept that everyone had, we were talking about video consultations, basically. And what happened instead is, I don't know, something like 90% of them are phone consultations. So they're not using video at all. And I don't think the Australian government, when, when they agreed to fund it, were thinking that they were going to be funding predominantly telephone phone calls. So, um, and we've also had uh, chemists, uh, so pharmacies in Australia, uh, you know, you can walk in there, stand, stand in front of a sort of console, um, get a telehealth consult from uh, and then get the prescription and just turn around and get it from the pharmacist um, and uh, there has been a huge pushback on that model from uh, from general practitioners as you could imagine so I think that's probably a piece of work that needs to happen is looking instead of saying it is telehealth or it's not telehealth there's graduations and what's most important is uh, just like everything is what's the most appropriate tool because that's all it is it's a tool to enable us to deliver healthcare. so what What's the most appropriate tool for this circumstance, for the needs of this patient? Um, and if we look at it that way, we'll get the right answers. Quick response to that, Dr. Luis, is very simple. <clears throat> as a practitioner, as a clinician, I'm supposed to give a legal prescription. I can't give this over phone, number one. Number two, I'm supposed to take consent. Number three, I'm supposed to keep all the records. All of that is not possible on a telephonic call. So as a doctor, I need protection. So the government might say, yeah, it's okay to go on phone, but it's not actually true. Because tomorrow if I land up in court, there's nobody's going to stand for me and protect me. So that's something that I think doctors need to understand, healthcare professionals uh, yes. professional need Medical to understand. Legal aspects. Yes, because we are doctors. At the end of the day, we are regulated. We are responsible. There's so another small simply, aspect. There's yeah. another small aspect, which is about the artificial intelligence. At least in radiology, yeah, another, at another least in dermatology, I myself am aware about uh, and part of three yeah. projects which are uh, one running from Australia very successfully, one from US, uh, which uh, kind of uh, do a machine, you know, it's a, a game thematic changing where they collate about millions of images of common conditions where the machine reads your inputs and gives out a suggested material. And uh, so artificial intelligence may be the thing of the future also, but uh, at present and for the next decade or so, we are not sure about where telemedicine, what percentage of uh, involvement uh, this platform will take shape. But that is certain that it will take shape. It, all such questions will be addressed and there's so much to look forward to. Yeah, Dr. Shanai, uh, yes, if, it is a, if it's a doctor from the hub that is uh, from the government side, he is reasonably legally secure for any issues because government has uh, this, uh, sponsored him and government has uh, located him at that point of time. This is uh, particularly with our Telangana project. So doctors uh, have no fears because government has ordered them to take the calls from the hub side. But as you said, it is an issue if it is a private doctor or with a charity hospital or somewhere else. Yes, the doctor has that insecurity issues. So Dr. Sitaraman, I just want to add to that. There are three areas under which doctors get uh, into trouble. One is the MCI Act, which is about our professional uh, misconduct. The second is under the Consumer Protection Act, where if you're giving free service, the Consumer Protection Act does not act on you. The third is the uh, medical negligence. Now, the first two are applicable to government doctors, even if you're giving it free. We may, not, we may avoid the and Consumer Protection Act. If the government tells me you give consults over phone, I can always say, I'm sorry, but I'm not sure that is ethical or legal. And even MCI says that you are supposed to provide proper prescriptions. The Drug Control Act says you are supposed to give a proper prescription. So, and if tomorrow you haul me up in court, who's going to show the record? So I think somewhere, you know, that's why the reason for such convers conversation is very important because we get carried away by the use cases and we say that, oh, it's very easy for the patient to access it, fine. But then at the end of the day, is the doctor or the hospital protected? And, uh, and the law is not going to say that, oh, you are working with government and giving free, so you know you can get away with negligence. So these are things that we, we face with our practitioners day in and day out. People are facing these problems. 85% of all litigation faced by doctors is because of lack of proper consent and lack of proper record. 
these are this is a fact so i think you know as we move forward and you know as we evolve and see things we have to take all these things into consideration by the way the mci act is very clear the, the guidelines are very clear on all the four so if somebody is still evading that they are actually not following the guidelines whether it's government or or practice or whatever at the end of the day the and the government did not give us registrations with the mci we got it because you know we we, we qualified thank you roshan so i think we should, yeah should could we take some questions from yeah, uh, sure. the uh, attendees because there have been a lot of requests Sashi, I have invited you to ask a question. Yeah, lots of questions. You have to unmute, uh, Sashi. You, you have, have to, to unmute, unmute yourself. yourself. Can't hear yeah, you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. So I want you to understand from you all. Uh, say we have a lot of. Uh, uh, especially uh, dr sita raman when he says that the, he has successfully implemented uh, telemedicine in three of the areas then um, i wanted to understand what is the unintended consequences uh, that he must have faced you know uh, in implementing all these uh, telemedicine uh, telemedicine um, you know programs Uh, we didn't come across any unintended consequences or problems. Or as our main issue is about the connectivity. So that is uh, still an issue because we took up in uh, rural areas of Andhra and uh, UP, there are, and also parts of Telangana. So that is connectivity is an issue, but uh, more or less it is getting solved with uh, better coverage these days. Uh, but for that, we didn't come across any unintended. Uh, consequences either from the government or from the public in fact public is some for some reason if we have to close a spoke or hub there's a big phone calls and requests because it saved them a lot of money a typical usage is suppose if i have to go to a cardiologist for my review he last he again of once i go there he ask me to go for 2d eco or ecg and some tests so people have become smart they come to the spoke they say that they are chronic patients so then we do the ecg some these things with this they go to their private cardiologists that was saving them both money transport and travel costs so also there are many unintended benefits that came for the government actually government used this tool to supervise its own staff to train its own staff so, so by and large the major unintended or uh, expected co complication or consequence was the connectivity issues thank you uh, i have a question to uh, professor nikhil tandon so so we did hear that there was a lot of benefits in terms of uh, red reduction of out of pocket expenditure and uh, improved benefits to the beneficiaries but um, yourself um who been leading a lot of m health and digital health interventions particularly in the area of chronic diseases um we see that when we really go and do evaluations of these for the benefits and the outcomes we rarely find that to be really moving the needle so in telehealth should we design these studies of evaluations in a different way um to be able to actually capture this both from a benefit and a cost benefit kind of approach I mean, is more of an academic question but being a research uh, organization we would be also interested in addressing this i i don't think it's an academic question i think it's a very very important operational question right because okay. somebody will have to make an investment to do telemedicine if it was not happening till now somebody will have to establish a process um and th there will be other aspects with so eventually you need to be able to demonstrate that whatever was done gave was beneficial to somebody now all i would request is not to put it down in terms of just you know rupees and paise we you know but that's because that may not because there are a lot of so i I'm, i'm going to give you a more sort of nuanced response to this i let's say i am a person who's got diabetes i'm supposed to see my doctor four times in a year because i need to present them with some information from which they'll make their decision i cannot travel to my doctor four times in a year instead of getting it done i actually end up seeing the doctor once in a year so i'm 
exposed to, potentially exposed to poor glucose control for a period of time. And I'm therefore not getting good quality of care because the doctor was not getting the opportunity to make suitable changes in their treatment. Now, what is the implication of that in the short term? You say, well, actually, it really didn't make a difference um, because the money spent by A versus the money saved by B is, is really not going to make a difference. But what is the long-term clinical outcome of this human being? And as I said, eventually, it has to be how you're benefiting the, the, ben the person who is supposed to be the beneficiary in that whole system. So you must do operational research. You must look at what are the best practices for delivery of telemedicine? But I think if we're looking at cost effectiveness studies, we really need to look into hard clinical outcomes also, instead of just looking at intermediate or surrogate outcomes and also measures of quality of life. I mean, it's, if it's so much simpler for me not to turn up and wait outside a busy clinic for three hours, three times a year, and I can get by by doing this on a telephone call, it's a lot, lot better for me. So yes, you need to study it. Yes, you need to understand the best system, but you also need to understand that the, that the models cannot be restricted to just measuring it in financial terms. Uh, just to add to what Dr. Tandon said, there's a Cochrane study. There are various studies you know, on, on chronic disease and how telemedicine has helped, and there are different nuances on that. But uh, just to give one example, uh, congestive heart failure or, or heart failure, uh, what they have studied is that uh, typically a patient undergoes four admissions in a year once they've been diagnosed as having heart failure. Uh, and those admissions are usually because of acute exacerbations, right? And uh, if they're being monitored well, even if it's like as simple as getting their weights done every day, uh, they can probably be, you know, identified that, that, you know, the water retention is happening, et cetera, et cetera, and can be, and maybe, and they have said that you know you could prevent those admissions uh, quite easily by just increasing the dose of diuretic if somebody is monitoring it, right? So yes, uh, to Dr. Nitin, just adding to what he said, it's just not the clinical outcome, it's actually the financial cost of getting admitted and treated. So both of them actually interact. And I'm sure he's a diabetologist, he knows more about this stuff than I do. <laughs> oh, sorry, you're an endocrinologist. I, I, I correct myself. You know, just to add, just to, I think that's very well put by sir and yourself, uh, Dr. Robinson. I mean, the, that's the basic idea of a teleconsult. I mean, you need, uh, obviously, we need study design, good study designs. You know, we need to generate more evidence, uh, proper metaphysical study. I mean, proper, uh, you know, evidence-based, double-blind, case control. So that kind of, we need cohorts uh, here or there. So, so that, that will come in future. But now there's a platform for us. And, and there, there are n number of options to study. I mean, the consent-wise, the fallout-wise, what happens to the doctor, what happens to the patients. But, but it's a very good beginning. And, and uh, we must now think of ways to take it to the people, actually, to, to the far-flung corner so that the last man in the line can be addressed, that, 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 that position can be addressed, how to take it to, to the remote corners. I mean, like the, the Telangana reach, which I was just listening. I mean, that's a fantastic idea. I mean, those people will be grateful, actually. Uh, wherever this reaches, the project reaches, and ultimately, uh, even if we have few beneficiaries uh, who can now experience the inputs, the, the uh, consultation with the experts who otherwise they would have not met. I mean, it's a fantastic idea. And obviously, uh, you have to now build in the data structure, the information. That, that, that will come, and that's already coming. So, uh, so again, I mean, so, so that yep. those studies uh, we'll have to create now. Good study designs, proper study designs, which will uh, tell us whether these four, uh, four times is as good as a once a year consult or a once a year, a four times face-to-face -face is as good as a once a year face-to-face -face and three times tele. Uh, so, so those studies with a proper study design, with a case control, with a proper... Uh, good methodology will give us lots of uh, inputs on various factors beyond the cost and Absolutely. the quality of life, which is very important. So how does the quality of life improves and what do we miss on doing a teleconsult? Uh, so wonderful. We have one question from Rajiv. I'm asking him to unmute. <clears throat> 
Right. Uh, I'd like to, um, Mark mentioned the difficulty in scaling up and sustainability, despite having uh, very, very uh, successful projects. And we have seen this experience all over the world. That's the global experience. Uh, would you like to expand on that? What are the reasons why this huge gap between successful pilots and the scaling up and sustainability decisions? Uh, <clears throat> I, I think that's a question for me to start, but I think others will have more concrete experience. But I think the reality is, is, is we don't uh, we don't plan and design with scale in mind, and uh, we we often have a sense uh, within I think the digital health um, landscape where uh, you know we we want to see if it works, and if it does, uh, we have to mobilize the resources and implement uh, accordingly, and. I think there tends to be a, a practice in digital health, particularly in low and middle income countries where these initiatives, telemedicine or otherwise, are initiated with uh, development partner funding or other uh, you know, small time limited resources without having the, the uh, capacity or, or maybe even the time, the luxury to adequately plan uh, for a long term phase wise approach uh, so, so I, I think that's really the bottom line is, is that we don't often tie the financing to get to scale uh, in the early stages of the of the planning uh, and design aspect of that uh, life cycle. Uh, but just because I, I, I I'm talking, I did want to make one other subtle point uh, regarding the, the prior prior discussion around um, where where are we in terms of the evidence and. Uh, for our listeners today, there is a WHO care guideline specifically on digital health interventions of which it uses a, a classification scheme of over 80 and close to 90 uh, digital health interventions of which there is a set around telemedicine. Uh, there, there, there is, uh, of course, a very due diligence process to uh, use the grade, which is grading and recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluations. It is a, a systematic approach to evaluate the evidence. And uh, at this stage right now, it's really, and, and, and I think it's part of the dilemma of getting to scale is that there's a lot of gray literature, but the evidence is really very thin. And there's only two uh, use cases that are supported with recommendations. And that is between healthcare provider to healthcare provider, as well as client to provider. And I'm just gonna read, it's very quick. The recommendations for both, uh, say, in settings where patient safety, privacy, traceability, accountability, and security can be monitored, and in the case of a client to provider, WHO recommends under the condition that it complements rather than replaces face-to-face -face delivery of health services. So, you know, we, we have to we have to recognize that uh, some of the barriers to scale is that uh, we don't see it working <laughs> at that magnitude in, in very many places, and. Uh, that that is often a function of the resource availability and the proper planning. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mahesh Gupta would like a question. I think he's raised his hand. Dr. Mahesh. I have an answer for that as well. While we're waiting. Uh, Mahesh, have you asked? A, sorry, you, did you say something? Anyway, I don't know. Is he still on? Go ahead, Luis. Talking Hi. permission, talking permission. Okay. 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 Yeah, Dr. Uh, Mesh, go ahead. Yes. Uh, uh, good at all. Uh, I'm a radiologist by profession, also into teleradiology for some time, also an NABH assessor for medical imaging services. My question here is uh, uh, particularly in the COVID period, uh, the radiology uh, reporting system has largely moved to uh, uh, online and work from home. All those radiologists, those who are full-time regularly working in hospitals and diagnostic centers have also moved to working from home. So, uh, which was earlier, in fact, their, uh, that was their concern uh, that it hampers the quality, but now everybody is working from home. Secondly, pathology. Pathology samples move from one place to another uh, and uh, the reporting doctor actually does not uh, get to see or ask questions from the patient at all. Uh, and that has been in practice for quite a long time. So my question here is whether the uh, regulations in India treat uh, this teleradiology and telepathology differently 
uh, from any other uh, telemedicine which involves a consultation and prescription. You want me to answer that or somebody else? So please allow me to just add a line. Actually, the medical imaging standard, Dr. Mahesh is our yes, yes. assessor also, and he is very well versed with our medical imaging standards also. We currently mm -hmm. have 19 standards running in various domains of accreditation, certification, and panelment. So one of that full accreditation is medical imaging standards. And in January this year, pre-COVID that is, uh, we jointly with IRIA, the Indian Radiological uh, Society, I mean, the, our National Society of Radiology, uh, we launched and initiated the second edition of MIS. I know. Uh, so, so this already has a section on tele-radiology, uh, yes. which is there. Uh, but we were constrained uh, by the uh, legal framework, which was not there for giving out proper thing. So now this telemedicine uh, uh, guidelines, which came in, have given us so much of stimulus. So beyond uh, like working on our digital health standards, which are a national effort, uh, we are also working on revamping the radiology specifically. Uh, right. so, so, there, so there's a need. Uh, we all know that this is happening. I mean, the reports are, are uh, crossing borders. The reports are crossing uh, boundaries of state and international boundaries. So it's always been done. But officially, there was no framework. So now with a framework in place, uh, we are very confident of uh, producing good guidelines which will give clarity to all the valid points which you have just raised. It's a very important point which you've raised. And this should cover now. Uh, I mean, I think we'll keep getting more uh, guidance from BOG. We'll keep getting more frameworks and guidance uh, from other uh, regulatory uh, authorities. And within that, uh, we will operate and draft some wonderful guidelines. Our experts amongst, uh, I mean, all of you, uh, subject experts will produce so guidance, which is best for the patient care. Because that's the only way... Uh, to reach out to people, to reach out to our ultimate goal of uh, universal health coverage. And and we must not forget that the center of it all is the patient, actually. So, so patient safety is paramount, and all of us are working ultimately towards that goal only. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahesh, for your question. Um, so we have about 15 minutes left, so I would request... Uh, key takeaway messages from each of you uh, in terms of if you were to, if what is the ideal scenario of a telehealth ecosystem for India as you see it? And uh, what are the factors that would enable that? And how can we all work towards that? I, I can start with a comment yeah, sure. if you like, because um, I'd already been thinking about it because of the previous question that Rajiva asked about um, the gap in, um, in going from pilot to large scale. And I think actually, if we take a step back, we can go, hang on a minute. We, our entire reality has just been challenged. So globally, the whole healthcare community has been challenged. All these things that we thought we couldn't do and that they were too hard for all of these reasons, um, uh, or there were too many things in the way. Um, the healthcare community globally has shown when we are driven by improving patient outcomes and improving patient care, We'll just make it happen. You know, we are creative, we're innovative. Um, we will do what it takes uh, to ensure that the best outcomes for the patients. And if you look at virtual care and telehealth, Australia has seen a tenfold increase in telehealth. I was just doing some quick research. I found an article that said that India has had a 500% rise in healthcare teleconsultation. 80% of those people are first time users. And in the United States, they've seen telehealth surge from like 8% to 29%. So globally, so I think we can actually challenge our own, because if you asked me that question in February, I would have gone, oh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I would have told you about why all the reasons that scaling is a problem. And we've just proven to ourselves, and it's not perfect, but we're not aiming for perfect right now, that there, there isn't a problem. We can scale very quickly. We can do it at pace and we can have excellent outcomes for patients. So um, so you, even though that was sort of my answer to a previous question, I think that's final thought is around those themes that um, when we work together and we collaborate and most importantly we're motivated by patient outcomes we can get things done in healthcare and that's something to be lauded and it's also something that we can capitalize on further as well 
um, so thank you. Thanks a lot. Mark, any observations? Sure, I can chime in as well. And, and um, yeah, I, I, I just want to piggyback on what Luis has said already that uh, our sense of normal health service delivery has been disrupted forever because of COVID-19. And, uh, you know, I, I think what uh, we're seeing in this environment, of course, and I've said uh, maybe in the chat window only, but that, uh, you know, telemedicine will become part of the new norm. And, uh, you, you know, beyond just the clinical aspects of it and some of the issues around um, consent and liability and all this, um, but, you know, there, there, there's other behaviors that we have to anticipate. I mean, just, just the fear of, of people not wanting to physically be, be in contact with somebody if uh, they just need to get some kind of a, a, of a follow-up consultation, et cetera, or, uh, you know, removing the barriers to the use of this kind of service uh, because of lack of uh, access to uh, uh, transportation and other things. So I, I, I think there, there's, there's a lot of, of, of situations that uh, besides the technology and does it work, but more just the way that we are going to be as a, as a society uh, have, I think, increasing uh, willingness to uh, embrace uh, telehealth and telemedicine in better and new ways. And, um, you know, th there's a lot of learning left to be done. I think it's a very uh, exciting time for, for digital, uh, but I think the success in India will, will rest in uh, the importance of uh, the initial, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, 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 the way that the National Digital Health Mission can operate, the way that telemedicine becomes part of that architecture, uh, the way that uh, health is treated as a, as a, a national priority in the socioeconomic development of the country. Uh, th there's a lot of political uh, and as well as uh, cultural and other uh, issues that ha also have to be really pushing and motivating us to use this uh, as a way forward to be part of our mainstreaming of, of, of service delivery. Uh, so I, I think it's an exciting time. And I think there's, uh, as Louise said actually earlier as well, and we've heard from many examples from uh, Dr. Atul and Dr. Tandon and others that uh, it works and we, we're seeing it working and uh, we just need to build on the success uh, and do it right, not rushed. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Dr. Sitarama, what is your key messages for a telehealth, vibrant telehealth ecosystem for India? Uh, sir, actually what we need is at the central level to have a simple and standardized EMR for a teleconsultation so that it helps with follow-up visits and continuum of care. That, that's based on our experience uh, because we used to different types of EMRs say, with the different uh, projects. But what we need is a standardized EMR that comes from the government of India saying that this should be the norm for a teleconsultation. So that uh, that can be stored in the cloud and the government servers and uh, that can be retrieved easily anywhere and uh, that gives a good continuum of care. Uh, this is uh, the basic requirement, at least at this point of time, from our experience. Thank you. Dr. Atul, from your perspective, you're leading a, a number of initiatives to make sure that there are standards, but what is your grand vision for uh, a telehealth ecosystem as well as a, a robust national digital health framework in place? Yeah, Dr. Rowan. So I'll just piggyback again on the backs of uh, Mark and Dr. Louis again. And uh, so what's been already said, it's a wonderful document. Uh, it may not be perfect, but, but then perfect is said to be the enemy of good. So it's a very good document, which we have to make better by, by a very holistic uh, collaborations. We have to take the world's best experiences. Uh, we have to now customize it. But I still feel, feel that uh, this is the only modality. It's not going to replace institutional care. It's not going to replace face-to-face -face medical care, but it's going to definitely increase the reach uh, of our healthcare delivery to the to the poorest of the poor, the remotest of the remote. And uh, it's the only way our big country can dream of uh, or aspire to providing the universal health coverage uh, amongst that SDG, uh, the sustainable development goal. I mean, uh, if we have to reach out to our people, then telemedicine is going to play a big part. Uh, 
for at least for chronic disorders for the large number of disorders and it's a wonderful document wonderful beginning and there's so much to look forward to positively going forward uh, so so thank you so much yeah, to uh, uh, for for giving us this document the bog the legal framework and and authorities are already thinking on those lines they they are expanding and what mark said it's very motivating uh, that political landscape is changing and this pandemic so it's it's one silver lining of this entire uh, madness which is around uh, so as a clinician i feel that this is a very very good uh, opportunity which has been given to us by the pandemic so let's make best use of it thank you dr shanoy you want to yeah uh, okay so uh, i would like to thank all the panelists and all the participants who came and you know spent their time giving us uh, you know different nuances of telemedicine i just want to leave behind three thoughts uh, one uh, telemedicine is not just tele consultation it's a much bigger piece so you know uh, it's about monitoring it's about education it's about uh, uh, mass level screening so dr sitarama has showed so many use cases of telemedicine i would like to say that one it is not tele consult alone number two uh telemedicine uh, use cases for telemedicine vary from specialty to specialty from uh, practice to practice and from the patient base that you are accessing uh, or you're trying to access to so there is no uh, you know there's no such thing as a telemedicine uh, copy paste kind of thing so you have to you know it's a practice and the last thing i would like to talk to my colleagues doctors is that uh, telemedicine is a medical practice it's not about technology it's again just you giving treatment and care or us giving treatment and care using telemedicine as one of the tools that we have which we use uh, you know in our regular practices so these are the three things that i would like to sign off on and thank you once again everyone including dr moment uh, for your uh, kind support and you know for the for the privilege prof uh, thank you dr chennai i would request uh, professor tandon to give his final words and a take back to the uh, board of governors recommendations that might be relevant from the larger context of what we've been discussing sir uh, your thoughts on how we can really build a, a robust tele health as well as a digital health framework um, sorry i forgot i was in mute i said this this has been really educational uh, i've actually taken notes uh, i can assure you and i shall feed back to colleagues uh, in the board um because uh, you know there's some very very important points which have been raised and, and i think they need special attention that's the first thing the question which you'd asked initially which people responded was was the telehealth ecosystem in india and whenever somebody asks a question about you know what's the indian scenario what's going to happen in india i start getting really worried at that point in time because you know it's 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 so heterogeneous uh, and complex a situation that to use a prescriptive uh, guidance is is fraught with danger you need a guidance framework but you need it to be such that everybody has a little bit of elbow room to interpret it in a fashion that is applicable and i think what dr uh, shnoy really said was again important that it can you know it it'll vary in different situations uh we've just heard the exceptional work which the tata trust have done in 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 telangana and andhra pradesh i'm not sure if the same would be possible in some other states certain states have shown much more enthusiasm for this sort of stuff some have not shown there's a huge difference between public and private providers there's a huge difference between individual private providers and corporate private providers there is also a lot of difference about when insurance will come to play i mean we keep hearing about what happened in the us in the us the insurance was the biggest impediment for telemedicine till covid came along and then they realized that patients are not going for inpatient visits so where are they going to get their money from and all all the speed bumps which they had articulated thus far seemed to vanish overnight right so we still don't know what insurance providers are going to do whether it's private insurance providers or government insurance providers so there's a huge landscape waiting for us we've got our paint we've got our paint brush i think it's time to do our own painting onto this landscape but i think it's important that there has to be a cohesive painting keeping everybody on this you know everybody on board because there will be huge hugely diverse nuances which will have to be reconciled but till then i seriously feel 
than a general framework which you know at least nudges people towards the straight and narrow is what is required and i think we made a reasonable start there and i would be the last person to claim that the that the document of telemedicine practice guidelines is is a is is, is a complete document or is a finished document it isn't it absolutely isn't it's definitely work in progress and therefore you know discussions like this and inputs from different sources are critical people should also realize that uh, that it's it's still awaiting inputs for a, a for a new version with passage of time uh, and and we would be more than welcoming any such inputs and therefore as i said uh, this has been greatly educational for me and my six pages of notes will i'm sure uh, help inform the board about what we should do ahead thank you thank you sir thank you thank you everyone uh, thank you prof tandon thank you dr atul that dr sitarama mark and lois uh, thank you for uh, for your valuable thoughts thank you for everyone who joined us today thank you dr shanoy for uh, thinking through this whole thing and helping us articulate and come up with this whole series and thank you everyone for being with us and what we will be doing is we will collate these into um, small briefs all the three of these consultations and send it round for more inputs because it it needs to be a, a a collective reflection of where we are at and grab the opportunity by its horns and really use it uh, the opportunity that is beckoning us and thank you everybody for being with us and george institute is really indebted to each one of you for your time particularly the panelists who have taken their precious time to be with us and look forward to working with you all um have a great evening thank you bye bye thanks dr john and uh, thanks all the panel speakers thank you bye bye thanks everybody thank you good night good night good, night. good evening bye. thank you sir thank you thank you thank you sir thank you thank you mark